Whew. I will not sing, because if I do, I'll empty the room. <laughs> Instead, you are lucky to get an abbreviated version of my experience. You may detect a slight accent. That's because I had a tooth extracted and alters my speech pattern. You buy that? I got a Brooklyn Bridge for you. No. It's really an honor to be here because you are the last generation to see a survivor of the Holocaust. At age 75, I paid somebody $5 to say you don't look at what happened. Just lost $5. At age 75, I'm one of the youngest survivors in the tri-state area. Therefore, whenever it involves driving, I get the honor. When you have to work driving at night, I get the honor. And because I substitute teach, when I school call for somebody, most of the time, I get the honor. Because I'm an old-fashioned substitute teacher. I know that you like to give teachers a little bit of a hard time, substitute teachers. Come on, I don't know your name. Let's see a hand of show of hands. Who gives substitute teachers a hard time? I know that. But what I do is I never call your parents. I never send you to the office. I don't give you extra work. I don't give you after school detention. I usually get applause for that. I just take you outside. <laughs> and I was at Yellowstone National Park last year. I fell. I hurt my hand, there are only two hits. I hit you, you hit the floor. <laughs> Any questions? It's amazing. Now, what prompted me to speak? I was substitute teaching one day at one allegedly the best high schools in the country. One of the students remembered that I'm from Europe. So he asked me, Mr. W, name like Weiner, people of lesser intelligence mispronounce my name, and I got tired beating them up. So they call me Mr. W. You're from Europe, right? I said, that's correct. He said, did you meet Hitler? After I collected myself, and I explained to him that Europe was a rather large continent, and besides Hitler and I were traveling in different circles, I explained to him that, no, I did not meet Hitler. Well, what did you do during the war? I said, I spent four years in a concentration camp. True story. Without batting an eye, the kid said, what were you concentrating on? <laughs> the, most of the students, I mean, as a joke, it would have been funny, but he had no clue. Most of the students busted out laughing. At that point, I realized that some of the graduates from that particular school are our future leaders. They are the ones that will make a world for my two lovely granddaughters. If they are that ignorant, that the effort must be made to share that, to share the experience. Now, I was only three and a half years old when I was considered a threat to the Third Reich, and I was marched together with my mother's family to a concentration camp. If you read my biography, it gives you most of the story. I would like to focus not on the horrors that you have read and you've seen picture about, but on the human aspects of the courage that people have to survive. Our accommodations were absolutely horrible. We were sleeping in barns on the floor on straw. It was cold. People found a barrel, a downspout from a bombed out house. They made a stove that kept us warm. It also served for cooking. As bad as the circumstances were, the people that were not used to hardship were the first to die, leaving a lot of, peop lot of young people orphans. With the little that we have, 
they created an orphanage where we were sharing our meager foods with the people that children that left behind. The winter of 42 to 43 was one of the coldest in Europe and Ukraine. People were dying. The undertakers were coming in the morning asking if anybody had passed during the night. They took one of the barns and made like a makeshift morgue. In our religion, there is a tradition that you are stay with a person that has deceased until such time that they are buried. We observe that tradition. And ladies and gentlemen, as bad as the circumstances were, I remember always being hungry, I remember being cold. We had a wedding. The groom didn't have a shirt. Probably bordered his clothing for some food. But he had a tie. He was elegant. My stepfather's brother-in-law was a cantor. That is the person in our religion that allegedly have good voices and they sing in the synagogue. He formed a children's choir, did everything possible to take the children's mind off the atrocities going on around them. I was only three and a half years old, as I mentioned, so some of what I share with you comes from what my mother and her sister, when they were reunited, were talking about. Later on, I was seven and a half years old when we left. I remember some of the things that I did. But fortunately, there is a lot on the internet and there are a lot of books. As a matter of fact, one of the books that I have out there pretty much follows the same route that we took. But the important thing is that people never gave up hope. And the Holocaust is not just an atrocity committed against Jews. It's a crime against humanity. Because in addition to the six million Jews, out of which one and a half million were children, there were at least the same number of prisoners of war, handicapped people, people with mental retardation, who were also slaughtered and they died. It really hurts me to tell you that we have not learned from that history. Today, it's not longer called the Holocaust, coming from the Greek destroyed by fire. It's called genocide, ethnic cleansing, but it's still going on. One of the most remarkable survivors, Elie Wiesel, points out very eloquently that if you do not take action, if you stand passive, you were just helping the oppressors, not the victims. Education was so important to us that people were allowed to bring only what they possibly could carry, but they brought books. The older women that were left behind, they did not work. Our labor camp was in charge of cutting a timber fortification for the Nazis. People that were left behind were on their own. We did not escape education. I remember writing with a pencil was as small as my fingers could barely hold on to it. We were liberated, and after a lot of back and forth discussions in the international community, we were repatriated, sent back to our country of origin, which was Romania. Anti-Semitism was still alive and well, but it was more undercover. It took us 14 years to try to get the Romanian government to let us out of the country to join family in the United States that came here way before the war. When I finally arrived to the United States in 2960, I was 22 years old. And Uncle Sam was nice enough to give me a whole year to learn the language before they drafted me into the army. 
and that is a long story that I will shorten up for your benefit, but of all their wisdom, they sent me to Germany. It sounds terrible.